on the legacy of Nelson Mandela and the current state of South Africa, we're joined now by Ibrahim Rasool. He is the South African ambassador to the United States. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. No, it's my pleasure, and thank you very much. It's great seeing you again. One year after the death of Nelson Mandela, perhaps a time to take stock of how far the country has come. What is your assessment? I think that it's one of the most important things that the country has a founding father so recent in its own life because his stature just beckons to you to do better all the time. And as a country, we can certainly do better. I think it coincides now with 20 years of freedom. And while we have enormous successes at the quantitative level, we've moved our country forward, we've got political reconciliation, I'm not sure that we are really making sure about whether the glue is holding um, that keeps South Africans together, whether we are doing the qualitative um, deliveries that we should be doing and whether we are managing um, the legacy of Nelson Mandela himself with a kind of decorum and dignity that Nelson Mandela would always have um, ensured. And so I think we've, we've got to do some deep navel gazing about the state of our parliament, the performance of our government, the energy within our nation and the hope amongst the youth. And so I think that there's always room for improvement and Nelson Mandela is a very good yardstick. Um, to use at a moment like this. Well, I want to get back to that in a moment, but what, in your view, was Nelson Mandela's lasting legacy, not just to South Africa, but to the world, in fact? I think we're realizing it more and more as we, A, get away in time from the Halkion years of 1990 to 1996 um, and so forth. We can now begin to see ourselves through the eyes of others. And sitting, for example, 20 years later, and across the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in the United States, I know that Nelson Mandela has an answer for a world that is deeply in trouble. The world now knows that unilateralism will not get it further. And so the kind of multilateralism that Nelson Mandela engaged in, always seeking the collective, always bringing people along, I think the world is ready for that, that it may have been 20 years ago. I think the kind of um, way in which the world has traditionally solved its problems through militarism, 20 years later, even the United States sees the limitations of militarism. They've not been able to extricate themselves from 30 years of continuous war. And so they are yearning for some formula that can take them onto the Mandela path, where political engagement, where good faith negotiations, we're investing in your enemy, um, we're reconciling at the end of it is more important than defeating your enemy militarily because today's enemies resist defeat. It's not conventional armies that you're fighting, it's ghost armies. It's ideas that you're fighting. You're fighting it at the level of social media. You can't stop the spread of recipes to make bombs. And so that's what the world needs, and, and I think that Nelson Mandela's time has come. Take us back to your personal relationship with Nelson Mandela. You first met him when apartheid was still in place. I met him when apartheid was in place. The country was in the grip and at of that a time, state of emergency. The ANC was still a proscribed organization. The ANC was in fact, banned. you would have been considered a terrorist. I, 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 I probably was because they just took me away, had no charges against me, and packed me in Polesmoor. Um, I spent six months... That's the prison that. in Cape Town. That's the prison in Cape Town. I spent six months in solitary confinement. And then the thing that made it all worthwhile was one morning the warden came and said, I must go to hospital. I protested but eventually went. And as he put me through the door of the waiting room of the hospital, he said, if you see someone there and you speak to him, don't speak loudly. And I went in and saw this person who could only be Nelson Mandela. And he knew we were there. He thanked us for our contribution. He was aware of the fact that amongst the political detainees with me were children as young as 12 and senior citizens as old as 80. And that was the first meeting that I've had with Nelson Mandela ever. Up till that moment, he was a blur. We weren't allowed to see him. We weren't allowed to hear his voice. We weren't allowed to say his name. And suddenly there I was meeting What year him. was that? 
That was 1987. Now, that's at a time when the violence was becoming more widespread in South Africa. There was a great deal of violence around the country. What did he say about his hopes for the future at that point? No, Nelson Mandela was actually, at that point, preparing for a post-apartheid South Africa because he sent us his projector and a documentary series on how the United States, for example, had integrated its people that came from all corners of the known world then to form the American nation. And when I spoke to him after his release about it, I said, why did you send us this? He said, because I knew that the biggest challenge was how to unite diverse people. And I wanted to see how the Americans were going about it. So you meet a man there in the midst of this deep state of emergency. 20,000 people just picked up off the streets and put into detention. People dying on the streets of South Africa all over. And here is this man in prison, 25 years already, 24, 25 years already. And he is, with great hope and optimism, preparing for how we will heal this nation of fractured South Africans. And that, I think, for me, said, what, what do I have to despair when I'm sitting in my lonely cell? What do I have to be hopeless about? And I think that that's it, an enduring hope and optimism but with the underlining of preparation for your future, not hoping for your future and not simply praying for your future. If we fast forward 20 years after democracy in South Africa to now, you mentioned some of the problems that South Africa is facing, very, very serious problems that it is facing. The government has its critics. One of those critics is a former member of the ANC, Julius Malema, firebrand leader of the opposition Economic Freedom Fighters Party in South Africa. He said in April that when Mandela died, he took his ANC to the grave with him. Look, I think that had Julius Malema said that while he was in the ANC, in the inner circle of the government and the ruling party, it would be very credible. I think the fact that he says it when he is competing for power against the ANC mm -hmm. has to be taken with some salt. Mm -hmm. The point that I would make, though, is that um, even the president admits that there is trouble. And I think that that's very important. And hopefully that translates into an all hands on deck call. That all those who feel excluded must come and help. That all those who are outside must come in. All those even in the opposition has a legitimate contribution um, to make. I think we've got to take this moment of respite when we all focus on Nelson Mandela and our debt to him. I think we've got to be humble and be able to solve those problems. And as, 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 as everyone is beginning to say, those problems are substantial, but they are not insurmountable. The DNA remains. The constitution Nelson Mandela has left us is still a constitution that is immune to abuse. Very quickly, I've got five seconds. Will South Africa ever see another Nelson Mandela? I don't think that we should, we, should, we, should, we should hope for another Nelson Mandela because every age has its person. I just think that what we should hope for is are people who have imbibed the life, legacy and values of Nelson Mandela and who are prepared to live up to it and not succumb to temptation. Ambassador, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.